Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Free Enterprise Forum, sponsored by the Ball Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise here at the Handcammer School of Business at Baylor. Uh, my name is Peter Klein. I'm a professor in the entrepreneurship department and a senior research fellow with the Ball Center. Um, it's a great honor and a pleasure for me to introduce uh, today's guest, uh, Steve Mariotti. Uh, Steve is an entrepreneur, an educator, an author, a journalist, and many other things. Uh, he is the founder and served for 30 years as the CEO of the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, which is the world's leading organization emphasizing entrepreneurship education, primarily at the high school level. And he'll tell you more about this organization uh, during his remarks. Um, Steve is currently serving as Senior Fellow for Entrepreneurship at Rising Tide Capital. And he is a weekly columnist for the Huffington Post. You may have seen some of his writings there. Uh, he writes about entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship, and related topics. Uh, now, Steve, Steve was a successful businessman in New York City. He left his business practice to become a special ed teacher in New York, uh, teaching in some of the most disadvantaged areas in New York City, uh, including uh, East New York, South Bronx, uh, parts of Brooklyn, where actually I was born. Didn't have the privilege of having Steve Mariotti as one of my teachers because I'm because I'm much too old, not because I was in the special ed program. But um, So I'm gonna show you a video in a few minutes that uh, summarizes some of Steve's experience in the classroom and how he realized he could use entrepreneurship as a way to reach some of the most challenged students in some very challenging environments. Uh, Steve is the author of many, many books, uh, including a high school textbook called Entrepreneurship, Starting and Operating a Small Business, now in its 11th edition, and a college text called Entrepreneurship and Small Business Management. Uh, his most recent book is called An Entrepreneur's Manifesto, published in 2015. Uh, we have copies of Steve's book available for purchase. Our friends at uh, the Baylor Bookstore have set up a table in the back. If you're interested in uh, buying a copy after the talk, he would be delighted to sign it for you. Uh, you can have a copy for yourself or you can give it as a gift. It would make a lovely Christmas present uh, for your mother and father who are paying for your schooling or anybody else important to you. Um, uh, Steve has had a very busy day meeting with students and faculty and staff here at Baylor and learning more about the many entrepreneurship programs and activities uh, that we have. Um, I've first known about Steve, or I first became aware of Steve from watching, from seeing him on a John Stossel special on ABC News, where he described his experiences teaching entrepreneurship to at-risk youth. I was privileged to meet Steve several years later at a Mises Institute conference, and we quickly discovered that we uh, shared, had many shared interests. We admired the same writers and thinkers and teachers and uh, really hit it off. So it's been great having him here uh, to spend the day with us at Baylor to talk about um, opportunities, maybe to work together on promoting entrepreneurship and promoting the free enterprise system. So before I bring Steve uh, up to the stage, I'd just like to show you a very short clip from that Stossel video that I saw so many years ago. I used to use it in my classes uh, when I was teaching about the basics of how a market system works. I would recommend this series to you. It's called Greed by, uh, by John Stossel. I think it was first broadcast in about 1998. So the, vi the quality of the video here, the video quality is not the best, but if you can forgive the low definition video and the outdated hairstyles and so forth, um, I think you'll find the content to be pretty good. It's just a short clip. Let me show this to you now. Still, I don't like to admit that self-interest or greed is the motivator. And we certainly don't like to teach that to our kids. But what if we did? Ah. This school was once considered New York City's worst, lowest reading scores in the state. Kids assaulted teachers more than once a week. One teacher's hair was set on fire. It was around then that Steve Mariotti left his import-export business to teach here. What's 40 plus 20? At first, he says he was a horrible teacher. I lost control of my classes. A kid got me in a headlock, rubbing my head. In desperation, he asked the kids, why are you doing this to me? 
One kid said, we did it because we can't, just can't stand you. You are boring. And I said, well, was there ever a time when I was a good teacher, when I touched you or taught you something that had any value? And the same young man said, the only time you really had value to, uh, to me was when you told us about your import-export business and how you bring in lady shoes at $5 from Anchor, India, add a dollar on for insurance and freight, take it down to the Lower East Side and sell them for $7, and your income statement would be $126,000. Oh, wait, he'd remembered all this from the beginning of the term? He remembered. And here was a guy that had been defined as, as brain damaged, emotionally upset, Every, people were afraid of him, and he recreated, in total, a Harvard Business School income statement. Does anybody have any ideas for a small business that you could start right now as a kid? Mariotti changed his way of teaching. And you can trade with anybody in the room. Now, he started talking about making money, and suddenly the kids were different. When you hear people complaining, that's where the big money is. They're suddenly interested in learning? They're suddenly interested in learning, and they come to life in the classroom. His teaching changed lives. You found my gotcha jersey? In high school, Frank Alameda was floundering until he took Mariotti's course. He graduated and went on to open this sporting goods store. Now he employs six people from his old neighborhood. I'm probably the biggest thing that happened to my family because I, I got people looking up to me, people that I grew up with, just oh, will pat me on my back, will say, Frank, keep it up. You're the only guy that got something going for you out here. That's one dollar, my friend. Howard Stubbs grew up in a poor section of the Bronx. Mariotti's course led him to rent a hot dog stand. Now he owns five and makes as much as $3,000 a week. You do get a lot of respect. You know, people look at you and say, wow, every day that guy, he's out there, he's making his money, he's doing his thing, you know. Will there be better days? Jimmy McNeil has a music business that makes more than a million dollars a year. He says he has this because of what Steve Mariotti taught him in high school. Children that are born into poverty are fascinated by capitalism and by ownership and by markets. Visualize them from the top. We think of capitalism as something the privileged practice, but in some ways capitalism is the big equalizer. Money doesn't care if you're black or white or green. Have a good day. It's the people at the bottom who need capitalism most, who need the, the, the system in which everyone is free to trade and free to pursue money because Capitalism opens up opportunities to climb up that economic ladder. Somewhere along the lines, Bill Gates started off with zero. Somewhere along the lines, Quincy Jones started off with zero. My rule for kids... It's not a color thing. You know, it's an opportunity thing. So greed has its benefits, but aren't we ignoring the downside? If you want to find out what happens next, you got to go to YouTube and look up Greed with Don St uh, John Stossel. You can find out uh, how the rest of the series goes. But um, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Steve Mariotti here in person to talk to us about not only about his experiences as an entrepreneurship educator, but more specifically about a new project he's working on dealing with uh, entrepreneurs in very difficult conditions. And so he's going to give us uh, a short talk followed by some questions and answers and audience discussion on a project he's calling The Triumph of the Entrepreneurial Spirit, Entrepreneurs in War-Torn Societies. So please join me in welcoming Steve Mariotti to Baylor. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, wow, cool. You know, my mother once said to me, she said, you know you're happy when there's nowhere else in the world you'd rather be. And that's how I feel right now. So I applaud you for incredible school and just a beautiful campus, a great reputation. And, you know, I travel around the world a lot and give a lot of talks and go to universities. And the energy that I feel, the minute really I walked on campus, but a multiple when I walked into this building. I mean, it was like, first time I've been to Switzerland, I was like in awe. And I'd say, oh my god, it's so beautiful. And uh, so I salute you. And um, I'm just very proud to be here today. I also spent an incredible luncheon um, with the um, 
your entrepreneurship faculty. And I knew that it would be a phenomenal conversation. It'd be fun. And because I've known Peter, and Peter's like, to me, world class in uh, this field that I love so much, teaching uh, younger people about small business and career opportunities. But it was really an incredible conversation. And we got into some fascinating debates. And afterwards, I was trying to tell my friend back in my, um, where I live in Princeton, New Jersey, I was trying to recreate it. And my friend said, well, that'd be a great article for you to write about. And I realized that I didn't tape record it. So I was kind of um, disappointed in that. So I got up and just started writing. And I think I was able to recreate most of the of that wonderful hour and 15 minutes. And thank you for, for being there and uh, what fun we had. So I want to just briefly tell you a little bit about um, my career, what I did with my life, and um, which isn't over yet. Uh, I feel it's just beginning, hopefully. Um, and then give you a couple of tips. And then I want to share with you, uh, through, through video primarily, a, a new project that I'm working on that I've been intrigued by um, for the last couple of years. And I'm hoping that I can work on it you know, for as long as God gives me, gives me uh, time here. But before I do that, I, I had so many beautiful moments today. But a really good moment was when I was outside and I was trying to get a feel of the room and et cetera. And I was kind of worried um, that nobody would come. And you all came, so I was so happy. And the two young students back and back were so kind to me and said, Mr. Mariotti, don't worry. And then this wonderful young woman walked in. And she said, oh, don't worry. All my friends are coming. So I walked outside. And on the wall, I couldn't believe it. It's my favorite scene. And it was such a magic moment. I turned and I said, oh, good. Everything's going to be OK, Steve. Calm down. And then I saw this. I'm going to take a drink of water first. Excuse me. Whatever you vividly imagine, ardently desire, sincerely believe, and enthusiastically act upon must inevitably come to pass. Paul J. Meyer. That quote's actually on my a bedroom wall. I see it every morning when I wake up. And I see it every night right before I I do my prayers and go to, go, to, go to sleep. And for me to see that here had just special, I was pumped. So um, what a building, what a, what a school. And uh, I hope all of you will get my contact information and stay in touch with me, because you're looking at, <clears throat> if I can brag a little bit, um, a, the only journalist, my second career, I'd become a, a journalist. And I'm the only person that I'm aware of who focuses on young entrepreneurs. That's really the only thing I write about. And I try to do 100 stories a year. And um, they're all positive. And I let the person that I'm writing about um, preview it first. So because I want it to be something they believe in and are happy with. So, if ever you're thinking, gee, I just started a company, or, or something happens in your life that involves um, uh, the struggle with commanding resources in your community, um, and you go, I wonder how we could get some media for this. Well, I'm your guy, Steve Mariotti. So I hope you'll email me, and I'll, I'll definitely try to do the story. I write exclusively for the Huffington Post. Um, how many of you read the Huffington Post from time to time? Oh, good. Thank you. So um, uh, I'll give you a little bit about my own, my own career. I was, uh, I'm from the Midwest, like, like in the Michigan, born kind of in the middle, a uh, place called Ann Arbor, and then was raised in Flint, Michigan, um, which uh, at one time was the wealthiest um, 
city under a million people in the world per capita. We had 39 uh, auto plants. We were the number one makers of Chevrolet and Buick. And um, it was just a great place to grow up. We had phenomenal elementary schools, junior high sports, high school. I learned 14 different athletics. And I was just, I'm very proud of my, my community. Over the years, you know, our, we forgot about the income statement and uh, the auto plant started to lose money. So we're actually down to one from 39. And um, there's not a day goes by that I don't communicate. I live in, in New Jersey now, in Princeton, and there's not a day that I don't communicate with my hometown about different ways to recreate ourselves. And I've sent at least, my friends are like, OK, enough. Uh, I've sent uh, at least four uh, emails today, long-winded, I admit, back to my um, uh, great friends in Flint about ideas that I got here in Waco and uh, from your community. So I really appreciate that. So I was, um, uh, I went to the University of Michigan and I was fascinated by economic theory. And uh, I started off as in the economics department at Michigan, but I had come out of a tradition of a school of thought, um, which is called the Austrian School. It's the Hayek and von Mises. And I urge you to, um, you know, to, to at least examine that literature. You don't, to, I have no, no agenda, whatever you decide, um, as far as your, the way to look at the world from an economic perspective. I'm 100% on your, on your uh, side with that. But I was not, I was not the mild-mannered polite gentleman at the age of 64 that you see before you today. But 46 years ago, I was more aggressive. And so I would challenge the professors who were primarily within the Keynesian economics uh, view, which is uh, different than a, um, an Austrian or classical liberal view. And they were very kind to me. I lo love my school. I'm very proud of it. But after the first year, the professors, the head of the department, he said, you know, Steve, you would be better off in the business school because they would, they would be more, um, they'd like you more, I think is how he worded it. Uh, as to non-like was my thought, but we'll let that thought go back into history. And he was kind enough to walk me over to the business school and introduce me to a famous economist, Paul McCracken, who became my friend and mentor and was just incredibly kind to me. And I spent six years there, and I was like, uh, I majored in finance, international finance was my specialty. And I got really good at that, like I could do, this is pre-computers. So I was able to somehow, just thinking about it every day, I was able to do all these currency uh, translations. And, you know, everybody would go, Hey, Steve, whether we'd be at a party or something, you go, hey, watch this. Hey, Steve. You know, I was like a, a trick um, a performer or something. And somehow that came to the attention of the Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, Michigan. And so as I was graduating, undergraduate, they, a very famous executive in the auto industry called me up and said, uh, I want you to come down here to finance staff tomorrow morning and interview for a summer job. So I did, and I loved it. And then I went back the next summer, and then I graduated in 77, and they made me a full-time offer at World Headquarters in Dearborn, which is if ever you get a chance to work in a treasurer's department of an international corporation, don't say yes, say yes, and sign before they change their, their minds. But I spent three years there, and I just loved it. And I, coincidentally, I was the analyst in charge of South Africa. For, uh, I wasn't running it. I was the financial analyst looking at all the numbers. And I was also the analyst in charge of Ford Aerospace Division. And so I, I would be the guy that would read all the proposals and check the numbers and 
retype the sheet if there was a mistake and all this kind of stuff. And it was just great. And I got to see how this huge corporation, bigger than I think 80% of the governments of the world at that time, managed itself on a global basis. And then one day, this flurry, and I'm, I'm on great terms with Ford. I love the company. And um, um, this was 30 years ago. But one day, a telex crossed my desk. And I looked down, read it. And, and then I went into the files where you know, nobody ever goes way back deep. And it's all paper. This is all pre-digital. And I pulled out this file. And it was the records. And Ford was open about it. What, we weren't, it wasn't a cover-up or anything like that. But we were selling wiretapping surveillance equipment to the Ford uh, South African government. And this was a time during apartheid. It's actually how it's been documented. It's how they caught Stephen Biko, and who was tortured to death. It's a terrible, terrible time in South African's uh, history, it's, which is now booming and doing much better. Uh, it was a time when Nelson Mandela was uh, imprisoned. And it really, really upset me that we were part of this tyranny. So naturally, I waited a couple of, of days and got my thoughts together, and then started to work my way up the ladder to argue against selling any type of surveillance equipment to a non-democratic uh, government. And uh, no one had ever thought that before. People had just thought, well, wherever we can make a sale, we should just make that sale. So it, it, it was also very profitable doing this. And at some level, it became very stressful for uh, the organization and myself. And it didn't end too well for me. Um, I was called into a meeting and given two years severance pay, which, you know, bless Ford's heart. And, uh, and then I, so I, I left under friendly conditions. And I'm still great friends with the family and the company. But I, seven years went by. And one of the happiest days of my life was seven years later, they actually passed for the board at Ford a policy against selling uh, any type of surveillance equipment or any type of equipment that could be used by a uh, totalitarian or non-democratic state. And I was very proud of that. Um, I moved to New York City. I was 26. I'd never been in New York. I loved it. I couldn't believe it. And everything went perfect for me for about three years. I started a business, uh, import-export. I started to make some money. I, I love selling. I had to find these unique products um, in these countries nobody would heard of. And i take them around to sell to wholesalers in New York City. And uh, you know, I had a knack for it. People liked me. And they'd buy the product. And then I'd get 10% of the revenue. So everything was, was going great. And then as, you, as will happen with you, and it's a beautiful thing. It's not a, a negative thing in any way. But out of the blue, when I least expected it, I had a traumatic event happen to me. And it was in September of 1981. Uh, and I got mugged in broad daylight on FDR Drive in a, a situation with my girlfriend. And it was you know, really unpleasant, involved uh, uh, two or three 13-year-olds. Uh, and I was really traumatized by that. I, I got what's called post-traumatic stress disorder, which is an actual um, uh, illness in the mind that they can take pictures of now. And it, it happens to people that have been in war or combat, people that were imprisoned, people that were uh, beaten up or raped. Or uh, you know, it's a huge issue in, um, in, uh, in, in our society. Uh, some estimates say 30 40% of our combat veterans suffer from it. And its, it, it, its symptom is basically you have the same thought over and over again in your mind. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. It's really uh, torture. 
So I was fortunate enough to be referred to a guy named Albert Ellis, who was this famous psychologist in New York. And he said, um, you can, we can cure this. And first he made me write down a sentence of what was bothering me, and it was, I feel humiliated because I was um, uh, pushed around and mugged in front of my girlfriend. And he goes, oh my God, that's so easy. And he goes, just change it to, I am a hero because I defended my girlfriend during an attack and no one was injured. And so I memorized that and 24 hours, I was like, it went away. It was a miraculous moment for me. And so I, I call him up and he goes, well, you're not done yet. And I go, no, but I'm cured. And he said, no, you have to come in and see me. So I go in and the building is still on 65th Street in Park Avenue. If ever you have an experience or you know someone who's had a, a, a trauma that they can't get over, I highly recommend you turn them on to this, um, this therapy by Albert Ellis. You can easily find it. Um, and he says, no, nope, we have to go even further. I want to drive this totally out of your consciousness. And, he, and I'd say, well, what do I do now? Is it a new sentence? And he goes, no, I want you to go teach. And I want you to find a, a school or a, a, a some type of educational institution where you would be the teacher of children that were similar that mugged you. And I said, well, you know, that was like an unfathomable thought to me at that time. Because at that time in my life, I just wanted to make a lot of money. It was, that was my goal. I wanted to be really wealthy and create a great business and be a legendary entrepreneur. But, you know, I obeyed him. Um, and I got a teaching job almost immediately at this uh, school, Boys and Girls High School in New York City in Brooklyn. Much better school now. But back then, it was... Um, you know, just full of tragedies. There had been two murders there. They couldn't, they couldn't get teachers to go there so that kids would have, there'd be 60 per, young people in a classroom with a teacher who was spending all their time trying to find a new job. It was just the worst situation. And, and that's where that scene happened, which I had actually forgotten about till today. But I was in a classroom and it was, it was torture. I could barely stand it. And I walked out, you know, prayed, obviously. I'm a big believer in that. And then I walked back in, and I started to talk to the young people about why they were so rude, not only to me, but to the whole school. And remarkably, they told the truth. They said, it's so boring. It's, it's material we've had over and over again since first grade. It's got nothing to do with what our number one issue is, which is poverty. It was a beautiful conversation, a golden conversation. And, um, and I said, was there a time when I was a good teacher? You know, in that horrible pause where I was waiting to hear what they were gonna say. And Edwin Blanding, I'm still acquaintances with him. He's gone in different directions in his life but a wonderful young man. And he said, you know, the only time was when you were talking to us about how to make money, how to create a small business. Um, and from that moment on, uh, that was in, in the spring of 1982, in the um, uh, fall of 1982, from that moment on, that's what I thought about. How do you teach someone who is penniless, living in very difficult situations, many times in foster care, many times incarcerated, um, many times in an abusive situation where there's an adult who's either rude to them or physically abusive and, and has become many times disconnected from their, their inner self or their spirituality. And that's what I've been thinking about since, you know, really, I've been thinking about it for 35 years. And, and have tried to write on that one topic. And so I spent seven years as a special ed 
um, junior high, elementary, high school teacher um, rotating through the system in New York City. And in 1988, founded an organization that I hope you'll all Google and look at. It's called the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, or NIFTE, N-F-T-E dot com. Uh, it's actually a charity, uh, but we couldn't get dot org. And uh, so for from 87, 88 until 2014, uh, what's that, 20, um, 17 plus 14, for 27, 28 years, I was the founder president of that. And we built it into this global movement, arguably the most successful nonprofit replication of my generation, I'm very proud of it, um, in youth work, a $19 million budget, $13.5 million endowment. We have um, 800,000 graduates from what basically is a mini MBA for kids, children in poverty. And um, they connect with each other. And uh, our top young entrepreneur in India this year was a Nifty grad. And uh, uh, about 10 years ago, they picked um, the top 10 young entrepreneurs under 18 in uh, our country, America. And seven of the 10 were Nifty graduates. I was extremely proud of that. So that's what I did. And I wrote all these books and textbooks. And that was the sole focus of my life for almost 30 years. And then I'm invited to Cambodia uh, three years ago to give 20 uh, talks around the country to um, college and um, high school kids. And I said, absolutely, I can't wait to go. And the State Department had uh, people go with me. And it was just incredible fun to, for me. And they take me to this um, uh, uh, S, um, S21, which had been this horrid. Have, have any of you been to Cambodia yet? When you can, go, because it really is a living monument to the horrors of communism. I mean, it's easy to forget that. I was starting to forget it. But what that philosophy did, not only Cambodia, but oh my heavens, you know, through, throughout a third of the world, actually. Um, but the Khmer Rouge took over Cambodia April 19th, 1975. And then without the use of bullets, um, literally no bullets were involved, killed 3 million people out of 8 million. It was one of the great atrocities, a very, very sad time in, in world history. And it's, it's, it's very seldom talked about or, or discussed. And I, I feel you know we shouldn't forget it. But I, was, I didn't realize all that. I'd read about it, but I didn't, I didn't understand it. And we're walking across to see this um, monument to all the poor people that have been uh, uh, murdered there. And out of the corner of my eye, I see a glistening white uh, you know, uh, uh, something. And thank you, Peter. And I reach down, I pick it up. It's a human tooth. And I'm sure all of you have had a moment, a spiritual moment, or a moment that just strikes you and goes right inside you. When that happens, make sure you listen to it. Because it was a moment when my relationship with, with what I believe in deeply spiritually spoke to me and said, you can't, you have to help figure out how to prevent this from ever happening again. It had been the tooth of someone who had been beaten to death in, these, in this killing field. And that started me on this quest of the last two and a half, three years to try to understand the relationship between entrepreneurship, you know, this craft that is so uh, integral to America's DNA. It's like part of us. And, and in war. 
and genocide and try to see what happens to the entrepreneur, to the society, when basically murder is made legal. That's what war, war essentially is. And so I, I, I really am still struggling with it and trying to understand it. There's almost no literature about it. So it's almost like the people that have been through this or thought about it didn't, didn't write about it. Entrepreneurs often are not writers, or they write how-to books. And people that are not in the entrepreneurial community don't look at the entrepreneur as kind of a unique um, type of person. And, and, and many, many times, the entrepreneur is left out of history books. I'll give you a great example. Winston Churchill, who I'm a huge fan of, read all of his material before I was 23, 24, on and on and on. I think he had 4.7 million published words, would write three hours a day, dictation, which is how I do it. Big role model for me. But when I got back from Cambodia, I went through all my collections and did Google searches and all this stuff. He never, not once, talked about small business or entrepreneurship. Now think of that. He was writing the history, uh, the history of the English-speaking people. Not once did he talk about this process of voluntary transactions and the creation of small business. And the great good it does, and many times some harm as well. But he's just one example, and he's, he was pro-business. Pro he was pro a, a free market system. Most historians aren't, and so they don't write about it at all. Or if they do, they'll have a paragraph or two that's very negative about the entrepreneur or the, uh, the capitalist or the person uh, creating a product or selling. So that really got my attention, that this historian of war, Winston Churchill, who I was fascinated by since I was a kid, had not once written about what had turned into my own career. And, and I thought, oh boy, there's something wrong here. So I I've, I've, I've read all the literature on the field, which you can do in you know, six hours, seven hours, and then um, my colleagues and I, and I want to introduce the president of my small but very proud company, Sophia in the back, if you can quickly raise your hand. <laughs> and our, our senior, Sophia is our president, and Peter Patch is our senior vice president, um, who's um, working on a wide variety of projects, but is working uh, on the issue of senior citizen poverty, which next time you invite me down here, I'll talk about. But today, I'm going to talk, I want to talk about uh, war and the entrepreneur. So we've, we undertook this quest to find 25 entrepreneurs who had lived through uh, a wartime situation and had had a business, started a business, or gone into business um, uh, during uh, before or after the, um, uh, either the genocide or the war. And we're videotaping each one and then writing about them, uh, trying to do in-depth research. And I want to show you one of the, I'm going to show you two videos. And um, I'll start with video number one. And I do so in the hopes that you'll see something or think a thought and, and do research in this area. Um, because I think it's really imperative that we think how entrepreneurship and markets can be used to not only solve poverty and many other of the problems that have plagued our world for since the very beginning, but also how it can prevent future uh, uh, armed conflicts. So I turn, I'll, I'll do one, and I'm eager to get your comments.
young and I was crying. I didn't know what happening. At the time, I was so scary. My time in Vietnam, of my childhood, you know, my um, my parents were divorced, and uh, after that, you know, I was the only child. Then my sister was sick, and my mom had to wholesale um, business store, and she give the, the 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 product to the vendor. So every uh, evening, afternoon, I had to have my mom go collect the money from the vendors, and I learned the business from my mom there. It's always my dreams and my goal that I always want to own a business and I've been working hard for 12 years continue education. I started with the nail tech and I became a hairstylist and finally I saw the long term that you, you know, the upstairs level here 1721 on Connecticut Avenue will be available but I didn't know that happened too, too quick but then uh, our landlord offered us to take the spot and I told my fiancé to take it this is my goal. I want to be, uh, you know, have a full service salon and spa in the heart of DuPont Circle, and I'm the only one here that survive, provide all the services for what all the women and men need it. It was frightening, you know. I've been told my, I've been told by my mom is uh, we're taking vacations, and the next thing I know, I was in the train in Saigon in four o'clock in the morning with my mom and had no idea there was stranger men came and talked to my mom and then all of a sudden we know I knew that I was on the train to China and we were in China waiting for a few weeks. The next thing I was on the boat to to go to Hong Kong but the water get in the boat so we all have to scoop it out by hand and by cup or whatever we're trying to to, to to stay survive. Not to have the boat sink because we know that we're almost there. Everybody on the boat were like um, chatting and say, "Oh yes, uh, if you see the mountain, right, very high mountain that you see, that mountain that you know that you are closer to Hong Kong." But in the middle of our trip, uh, we uh, get stopped by the patrol boat, uh, checking on everybody to see if there anything illegal. They was uh, home armed with uh, a gun and they check everybody and everybody have to show them everything that you know take out from their pocket see what you're hiding um, in 1991 we had to transfer into a different camp which is it's called uh, Tai Achau Island a TAC island it's a small island it's a abandoned island nobody lives there so that's why they put all the refugee in that island a lot of like bad things happen fighting and killings and all that kind of stuff it was really lonely, you know, all of a sudden like you had friends back home, your family, your aunt, and all of a sudden you in the camp, you just you and your mom. But we were able to, you know, look out for each other, support each other. Last year, I had 2016 in September, I had a reunion in LA. So for the first time, we had a reunion party in LA that where we met um, all, some of the refugee camp that we live in the same camp in Hong Kong. Everybody looks good and I'm so happy everybody doing well and I have a few compliments that my friends say to me that uh, among all of us here, you are the successful one, that you are very uh, entrepreneurial. Yeah, all through those experiences definitely make me a lot stronger, being things more self positive and appreciate what I have, appreciate every little thing. Be humble, be kind and, um, and never lose track of your dreams. You never let anyone tell you that you cannot do it. We left Vietnam late in uh, August of 1978. By the Mekong uh, Delta, uh, from there we go to the, uh, get sailed to the ocean. But uh, before we even get to the ocean, our uh, boat was cracked on the, on the bottom. So good thing that the pump in the, in the boat was working. So the whole trip that we went from uh, the Vietnam to East Malaysia, Kuching Sarawak uh, on the Borneo Island, the pump was working. So we were on the ocean for eight days and nine nights. During the trip, a lot of people could not eat because they have seasick um, for that. And uh, we just drink water and uh, just uh, hope to get to the uh, destination sooner, sooner, so everybody just hop for that. Luckily, we survived that, and we also survived the pirates, the pirates at the time. 
Uh, at that time, a lot of pirates bore around that area because they tried to rob all these uh, all these boats that left Vietnam because they think that they have uh, jewelry, they have some valuable things. After we uh, after we got accepted by the uh, the Malaysian government and we stay in the refugee camp and just wait for the uh, the embassy of different country and USA is one of them. The embassy of uh, of uh, US come to interview and then accept our family to come to the US. And after that, all the refugee family would be sent, the information was sent to New York City at the time, they called the Refugee Center. So they can find sponsorship everywhere in the United States. Either the church, nonprofit organization, or even individual can sponsor that. So the First Baptist Church of Irwin, Tennessee, uh, sponsor our family. That's that's so that's when we got to go to Irwin, Tennessee. Luckily, we don't have to worry too much. We got to Irwin. We got a very welcome, uh, warm welcome by the church and the people there. And uh, we were we were there for. I lived there longer than any of my family because they all left afterwards uh, a year or two. Uh, my my sibling they went to uh, to college after they graduated from high school. But I was there because I lucky I get a job with the railroad. See it, the uh, Greensfield Railroad and then later become CSX. And I was in um, college at the time. I was in um, East Tennessee State University. So finally I graduated after five years of working full time and uh, go to school full time. I joined uh, the chef and, uh, and, and to run the city lights of China. And actually, in the 1990s, that, that was the, the Chinese restaurant in town. We have a lot of people. We serve the Clinton administration. We serve a lot of uh, congressmen, senators, and embassy from different, from different countries, and ambassador from different countries. So we are, we are lucky. And then after 10 years in the basement, I decided to move myself out. So I thought I could get out of the restaurant business and do something else, but then I still miss it. I miss the customer, I miss the staff, I miss it. So I came back in uh, 2000 and opened Miwa restaurant. Go to business in general, and especially restaurant. The three things that, that, that you need to know is work hard, work hard, and work hard. When I was first opened, I worked six and a half and seven days a week all the time and sometimes I have to take the shower at the gym in the building and then stay here at night, sleep on the sofa because it's no way to go home late at night and then come back the early morning. So I stay here many days like that all the time. The second, uh, the second advice I would say is challenge yourself because you have to push yourself hard to, to, to do the thing what you want in this uh, business, what you, what your, what your goal, what is the uh, market that you think you want. So uh, that's the second. And the third thing is running a restaurant, the cost. Control cost is the very important. If you don't control cost, your profit margin will be less and less every day. Well, at my age right now, I, um, probably don't have a lot of uh, goal, but I'm still enjoy what I'm doing. So I'm still keep on running a good restaurant in, in Tao. And, and the restaurant is the most uh, important is the, you have to like people. Because you deal with people every day. Uh -huh. Different walk of life, like people. people come from different places. And how you deal with people, and how you take care of the, in our business we say so-called the high maintenance customer. Regardless of what you do, you're never satisfied. But I love to do, I love to take care of these kind of people because I always tell myself, if I can take care of the people that so-called high maintenance, everybody else so easy. So that's the, the challenge. Training. You challenge yourself. Challenge. Yeah, and uh, that's it. Um, what, I'm dying to hear what, what you guys think. And... Um, you can 
ask any question or make any comment. We don't have to talk about this, um, but um, I'd love to. Any comments or ideas? Yes, young man. <laughs> One word. Absolutely. Um, uh, he asked, what is the common characteristic of the entrepreneurs, at least that I, I've met, and young people that are uh, in small business. It's just one word, and it took me like 30 years to realize, for me at least, tenacious. Any thoughts on the video? Was, were, were they helpful? Um, what do you think? It, I, I think that both, I started with Vietnam because you know, it had such an impact on my generation. So I wanted to, you know, get the experiences of people that had lived through that war while, you know, it was going on, and then, uh, you know, left. And in doing the research, I found that about a million and a half people left by boat, and up to half of them died, dr drowned, and, you know, with no record, like people have just have forgotten that. Um, and there's something about that word tenacious. I love how it sounds. And for me, that has captured a lot of key moments in my own life where, you know, I kind of came to a pivot of whether I was going to, like, gut it out and keep doing something, or would I, you know, kind of go in a, a different direction. And, you know, it's all spiritual. You have to listen to your inner voice. But I was always, so far, I've always been able to, when I knew that I was on the right path, I stuck with it no matter what. And, uh, you know, it, um, that word has become very important to me. And it was actually used in one of these interviews and that's when I realized that, that how important that word was to me. So um, I can give you, if you'd like, I'd like to give you uh, five tips in small business. Would that be helpful? Number one, never, 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 never compete. Always find what everybody else is doing, then don't do it. That, I think, is, in my opinion, the most important lesson in, um, in uh, entrepreneurship or small business, is to always have a comparative advantage, always be different, slightly different. So you're never a commodity. Number two, learn communication skills. Learn communication skills. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. If, if anyone can't hear me, just raise your hand and I'll like speak louder. But the ability to communicate um, and particularly, particularly in business, in through media, and creating a brand, is worth, you know, it's incalculable. It leads to profits. It leads to finding employees. You can you can change your community, your town, your city, your state, and and the world through 
really effective communication. I apologize. Yes, I didn't see your hand earlier. Um, yeah, uh, there, there's t uh, two hands up, so I want both of you to. Oh, that's all right. I like it when that happens. You know, I can, it, it all depends on the country and the, the nonprofit. The, the, there's a, a discussion in, in the um, international community on economic development. Uh, do NGOs, uh, non-government organizations, help or hurt um, the quest to end poverty and, and solve problems? And, you know, it, it all depends on the country and the organization. A role model for me since, I think, 83, who I wrote to over 70 times, and he was kind enough to always write back, many times on my own letter, which you know, was flattering, and mail it back to me. But is Muhammad Yunus of Grameen Bank you know, in Dhaka, um, uh, Bangladesh. And I would study, for me, that is a nonprofit or an NGO that has done 90% good. I'm sure, you know, whenever you act in a market, no matter who you are, you do both good and harm. That's how markets are. That's how any action is. And, but I would, he's been a role model for me as someone who has done way more good than, than any potential harm. But it, it is a huge issue before you take any action to think, what harm does this do as well? Um, the young man right behind you had his hand up. I wish I had, I've tried. Uh, Peter, the question was, while you were overseas, did you pick up any of the languages? And my answer is, still the same. I, w I tried, and I would get private tutors. I took Berlitz, and it was a huge goal of mine to try to become fluent. And I just was never able to do it. And um, so it's just a, sk a skill that I don't have. But yes. Um, uh, both. Um, my, my first big trip was in 1989, and I refer to it just because it, I, I uh, was brought over by, the, um, by Gorbachev during that 500-day uh, revolution. You may have just been um, uh, you know, in elementary school when this happened, but it was a very significant event. The uh, Berlin Wall fell. And you know the this really weird system. When you look back on it, it's kind of hard to believe it. But this um, just tyranny across Eastern Europe, just oh, really within a year, collapsed. And they were looking for a teacher that they could would come over for a month and teach uh, 300 of the um, top Soviets, as they they called themselves, their children capitalism because there was there was a plan over 500 days to take uh, USSR from a communist country to a uh, capitalist country and it, the transition didn't go well uh, it, it was full of um, uh, fumbles mistakes and it really wasn't anybody's f uh, fault no one had ever tried to do that before but they brought me over for a month of uh, six weeks actually and I stayed in the um, KGB uh, training facility, which is about 30 miles outside of Moscow. And it was an incredible experience because there were 300 kids whose parents were running uh, the, the empire. And uh, there was, uh, 
every language, if I'm, this is what I was told, but every language in the world that was used was taught at that center. So you would have, one, you'd have all this modern technology, and two, you'd have these real people that had been identified at a very early age as gifted in language that were there. So I, I had four or five translators, and it was, uh, you know, I never had an experience like that after that. There was always language as an issue. So um, I'd have to, uh, when we were replicating, we'd have to find someone that could translate the materials into English. And then when we'd visit, you know, finding a person that was uh, fluent in culture and language was, was absolutely essential. Um, so if ever you build something, then you want to replicate it. Language becomes extremely important. Very uh, insightful question. So I'll give you three more tips. And the third one is, what was the first one? Never, never, never compete. Now, you very seldom will hear that. And if you say that, like if you call your mom tonight or dad, you say, well, this short, handsome guy came down from uh, New Jersey, and he said, never, never, never compete. She's, she's going to put your dad on, or vice versa, and they're going to say, you're going to be upset that I said that. But tell them I was giving you advice in small business, and they'll go, hey, you know, he's right. What was number two? Communication. Oh, my heavens. If I had my life to live over again, I would have spent more time in learning to communicate, to write, to speak. Uh, third thing is um, story development is a, a craft unto itself. Story development means that you are telling the absolute truth about your life or your business or your friend or an idea that you want to advocate. But you get it down so it's a story. That's how people learn. That's you know the lesson of the Bible really is, is that really people most effectively learn uh, through stories. The fourth thing, and this has been really easy for me to do, maybe harder for you, but always hire up. Not once, um, you know, I probably have been involved in the hiring seven, eight hundred people, even more than that, over the past thirty years. I would always find somebody that was more talented, smarter, whatever, than I was, and it's. A lot of people subconsciously can't do that. They're, they feel anxious when somebody is like, you know, seemingly uh, more skilled than they are, and they shy away from it. Do the opposite. Um, the, your life's work will depend on, on who you partner with, who's on your team. Hire the best and the brightest and treat them well. And the last thing, I'm trying to give you advice that, that you don't normally hear so that it, it'll add some value. But the last thing is whatever you're doing when you're trying to interact in a market, uh, you, you've started a business or you've started a nonprofit or you're working for someone, you're trying to sell something, Always start with the economics of one unit. And that's my first lesson with young entrepreneurs. I try to break everything down to the unit that we're selling. And you'd be amazed. Whenever I see a business failure, I always, you know, without causing more pain than good, I always try to analyze it with the entrepreneur what went wrong. And it almost always comes down to a miscalculation of the unit. So just to be crystal clear, a unit would be if you're selling Visa V pens, does Steve use Visa V pens or what? Yes. Um, a unit would be you could sell them as one, or you could sell them as a dozen, 
or you could sell them as 12 dozen. And whatever unit you pick, you have to be the master of the economics of that unit. And most business failure, in my opinion, is when the entrepreneur or the manager doesn't really know the economics of, one, of, of the unit. It happens all the time in the restaurant business. I'll give you one example. You, when you talk to someone who's had a bad experience in the restaurant business, again, don't do more harm than good. But if they're comfortable talking about it, ha ask them what was the, their economics of one unit. And almost everyone who doesn't do well in the restaurant business, when I ask that, They'll go, I don't know what you mean by that. What does that mean? And basically, there are many ways of doing it. But the way I teach it in the restaurant business, you take your average customer and their average purchase, which can take a lifetime to understand it. But all businesses take a lifetime to make, become successful. And then you calculate down to the penny the average cost of that unit. So. Let's take as an example, customer comes into your restaurant, their average um, purchase is $5, and you would calculate that the cost of that would be, uh, on average, $1.80. So your gross profit is $3.20. Once the human mind, this is my theory, once the human mind understands that and has drilled on it and is obsessive about it, all the other issues in business, your fixed cost, who you hire, your marketing, become almost natural. They flow out of that. You very seldom make a big error in marketing, in my opinion, when you fully have grasped what is the unit you're selling. With that, I want to bid you adieu and to say that if um, I can never help you. I'll do that. Just say, I was one of the uh, young people at Baylor when you came down and had that wonderful day down in Waco, and I'll remember you. And then I urge you all to take a look at my, my books, um, and uh, I brought three of them down. Um, and if you, if you can't buy it, don't worry. You can make it up to me by going to HuffingtonPost.com and typing Steve Mariotti and you can read just one of my articles, and that would mean a lot to me. Um, and I have business cards for all of you if you're interested, and I've had an awesome time. Peter, thank you, you've been a wonderful friend, and um, oh good, I'm gonna get something. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for coming, and thank you, Steve, for a wonderful talk and for spending time with our students and staff. We have a very small token of our appreciation for you. Thank you. But uh, we hope that you've gotten much more out of the visit uh, Baylor business. Uh, than, uh, than that. So again, we do have books available for purchase in the back, and Steve would be happy to sign one for you. And uh, if you have any, if you don't, aren't able to get a business card and you want to get in touch with him later, just please let me know or let any of the entrepreneurship faculty or staff know, and we'll be happy to pass on uh, his contact information. So Steve, once again, thank you for coming to Baylor. You're welcome, Peter. Thank you.